I just thought she must be amazing, and as it turns out, she absolutely <laughs> is. So Marie did not start off as a lawyer. I think she came to it after several rethoughts in terms of her career decisions. Uh, she went to the University of Arizona for her bachelor's, and she got her JD at the University of San Francisco. Came to San Diego, needed a, needed a change of pace, and as she says, sort of fell into this work. And she was involved in the gas lamp quarter from pretty much the beginning of when it became a national historic district and involved in some of the most significant buildings in the district and I'm sure she has a wealth of information that she could tell us whether she's allowed to or not. <laughs> that whole, you know, client privilege thing. Anyway, we're thrilled to have her here and she's going to talk to us about what actually kick-started the development, in the, the redevelopment in the gas lamp quarter and it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and that's Oliver. <laughs> Hi, Marie. Hi, Oliver. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming. I uh, have prepared these remarks to sort of explain the theme about what made the gas lamp quarter really take off. But I want to give you a little background, if it's all right with you, to explain how fortunate I am to have landed in this situation. Uh, I was a deputy city attorney for the city and county of San Francisco for nine years. And I decided to leave that job, and, but I knew I wanted to stay in municipal law. So I um, began thinking about what did I think sh was important to have happen or not happen in a city. I had no idea what it was, but I thought if I can figure out that, that's the field I will, would go into in my practice. Um, and I was running in Golden Gate Park one day, and I saw a historic building being restored. And I said, that's it. <laughs> that's why I love San Francisco, because of the buildings. So um, I just had decided to leave San, San Francisco. And if you're an attorney, you don't want to take another bar exam, so you stay in California. <laughs> And like many of you, you end up in San Diego because it's a wonderful place to be. So I came down to San Diego and I knew I needed more education to work in this field. So I went to the University of San, uh, San Diego, which I chose by its appearance. I didn't know anything <laughs> about schools here. I went in and I asked for the graduate catalog and literally, you have to believe this, that catalog fell open at the page that said, Master's degree in historic preservation. Just like that. So that was easy. <laughs> and uh, the next day I went across the street and enrolled in the program. And the leader of that program was Dr. Ray Brandis. And he really created historic, pres well, he was important in creating the historic preservation field in San Diego. Uh, and he did it by having his graduate students do the work and assemble the reports and so forth and so on. So one of the productions that came out of that um, office was the CETA reports, that's C-E-T-A. And Sandy, our local historian, she uses those reports in her work writing her articles about the Gasland Quarter buildings. So I worked with Dr. Brandis and worked on my, I was working on my master's degree. And this is all about the time that everything started happening, which would be in the early 80s. Uh, and that's when the Gas Lamp Quarter Historic District was created. And that's the map of the district, um, hand drawn as you can see, and it has all the buildings identified. The, when you look at it later, the buildings with a Roman numeral one are the ones that are considered contributors to the historic district. And the ones with the Roman numeral two are not. So that gives you an idea of how they were evaluated. Um, the people involved and I think Catalina maybe knows more about this than I, but the key people involved were uh, Mike Stepton, who was very important in creating this historic district. Maybe he's spoken to you. And um, Tom Hom was very important. And I'm sorry I can't remember some of the other names, but there are gr individuals who realized that it was very important to save this area as a historic district before it got redeveloped and changed. Uh, and the reason these buildings were here for so long was because this area had been no man's land. People didn't travel south of Broadway. It was considered a dangerous neighborhood. And so the buildings didn't get redeveloped. And also, excuse me, um, 
the uses in those buildings were tattoo parlors, strip joints, ta you know, all the sort of unsavory activities. But those unsavory activities paid the rent. <laughs> So the building survived because there was rent coming in and there wasn't a demand for new development because, you know, the, <coughs> the upright people we didn't want to open a store or be involved in this neighborhood. So that's really what saved the buildings. So there we have the Gaslamp Quarter District was uh, established legally. It was approved at the federal level and the buildings that were identified are, as contributors were recognized as contributors and therefore they became under the control of um, certain rec regulations and protections. At the same time, the um, federal government initiated the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program. And I think there was more than one uh, series of, of uh, laws, but it started about seven, either 76 or 78 and it went into 1986, different versions of these incentives. And Oliver here, my friend, was the tax expert uh, in this field for many years, uh, representing many of these property owners. So he can tell you a lot more about these tax incentives than I can. This is all, these incentives are important because you remember last week, last month, when Dan Pearson spoke, he brought, talked about the fact they could get no financing down here, if you remember. that. And when he was doing the Horton Grand, no bank wanted to lend south of Broadway. And it was a very difficult situation to get financing. Well, that's what the tax incentives came along. And that's why I say it kick-started kick the gas lamp quarter. Um, so I arrive into the scene, and I open my office in the Carriage Works building. And all of a sudden, there's all this work for me to do. Because as people start investing in these buildings and applying for the tax credits, they have the architects designing the rehabilitation and planning how to rehabilitate the buildings. And they needed someone to do the paperwork that went from the architect to the government. So I started preparing the applications for the tax credits for these buildings. And um, that was nice because I had a lot of work and I was working with very interesting people and I was working in something that I really wanted to be involved in. So, um, the, pro the properties that are eligible for these tax incentives, which by the way still exist, are they are either individually listed on the National Register or they are a contributor to a National Register Historic District. And of course, in the gas lamp, we're talking about a National Register Historic District. Um, it started out where the tax credits were 25, at a 25% level uh, all across the board. Then they got it reduced to 20. But we had a very nice active tax attorney here in town named Jimmy Schneider, who managed to lobby and get the gas lamp quarter tax incentives still at 25. So they are at 25, and the others, other parts of the city, they're 20. And if you're just a building, an older building built before 1936, you can get 10% tax credits. So, and tax credits, if you're familiar with them, they are, of course, better than deductions because they are credits against the, the tax you owe. Um, the important thing about the historic tax credits are they're all governed by a, um, there's a substantial rehabilitation test. Uh, it, this kind of benefit is just for, isn't for a cosmetic work. It's for a substantial rehabilitation that will be preserve the building. And the way that is determined is the expenditures on rehabilitation must exceed the adjusted base of the building. And um, I'm going to ask Oliver to close his ears as I talk about this. But basically, <laughs> the way I handle it is. Um, you have to spend more than half of your purchase price on the property for, in credit, for the credits to qualify. If you buy a, a building for $400,000, you must spend at least $200,000 in rehabilitation. So it's meant to be for substantial rehabilitations, not just cosmetic work. And the rehabilitation work has to meet the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. And these standards are 10, and they've been around for 40 years or so, and they are very easy to understand. Well, not easy to understand and apply, but it's, it's possible to understand and apply <laughs> these rules, let's put it that way. So what I did on these projects and what you have to do, and it's the first thing you do 
is you do a part one certification application and you do that to establish that the building is qualified to be listed on the National Register or qualified to be considered a contributor to a National Register district. So you do the part one and you submit that to the State Office of Historic Preservation, which we call SHPO, and if they approve it, they send it on to the National Park Service. If they approve it, that's NPS, then you are a qualified, um, hist a certified historic structure and you're eligible to participate for the credits. Um, then the next, stop is the next part, the part two, is a little bit more difficult and can take a year or two to complete. So in that, what you do is you have the, the architects prepares the drawings about how they're going to rehabilitate the building and you have to prepare a discussion of the changes that are going to be the scope of the work for each item, like uh, second story windows or um, uh, the flooring in, in the banquet room or something. You have to do one description of what's going to happen to the building, uh, what, no, excuse me, what its conditions are now, and you have to have photographs to prove that, and then what the work is going to do to it. And this is all backed up by the, the architectural drawings that you have to cross-reference. And so you prepare that for your whole rehabilitation project, and then you go through the same steps. You go to the SHPO in Sacramento, and they quite often help you and help you revise it if it's necessary, or they ask you to change it. And then when SHPO approves it, you go to the National Park Service, and the same thing happens there. And then when the, sh when the National Park Service says this is acceptable and they approve your part two, then you start work. And then you do the rehabilitation work. And of course, during the course of time, when that happens, um, changes happen. You uncover something in the building that you didn't expect or was wrong, or you try to fix something and it doesn't work. So then you have to do a, a follow-up application. <coughs> and you have to show all the changes and why you can't proceed and what you need to do and you go that through the state and through the feds so you can see these things can take time and a lot of stress but anyway finally you get through and when your when your part two is approved as i said you start the work and then uh, when it's all done you prepare the part three and you go around and you photograph everything that's been done and you send that in through the ship and nps and then Hopefully, finally, they say, it's good. You're good to go. So then you get to um, apply for the tax credits. Um, <coughs> the, the expenditures that are included for calculating these credits are all the expenditures within the footprint of the building. So that could mean a new electrical system. It could be new, new uh, air conditioning. It could be everything that happens within the footprint of the building. And it doesn't, the land is excluded. That isn't involved, but all the work that you do within the building. Uh, and once the NPS approves the part three, then you're good to apply for the tax credits. You're eligible to apply for the tax credits. Um, so the tax credits bought, bought finance, something like financing money into the gas lamp because the tax, the tax credits you could use to pay off your mortgage or pay off your loans on the building. Or actually you can sell the tax credits. You could sell the tax credits to people who need tax credits like Exxon or Mobil and they buy the tax credits and then the money you get you can pay off your work and, and you have a rehabilitated property that's ready to go. So in a really down economy where it's, it's an area that has not been a success because of historic buildings or whatever, uh, there's a way for money to come in and uh, rehabilitate these buildings and save them and all of a sudden you've got a wonderful community of, of wonderful buildings. So it's, it's a very interesting um, legal concept. Um, it doesn't really exist here anymore. The law still exists but in the gas lamp quarter uh, the land value is so high, it's very hard to meet that substantial rehab test because the land values are so high. About two years ago, I had someone call me and they said they were wanted to buy the broker's building and they wanted to get tax credits. And I asked them what they were going to pay for it. I can't remember what they said. But let's say they said 400000 
And I said, are you going to spend more than 200000 on work? He said, don't be silly. So, needless to so, say. That's why the whole thrust of the program is to go into uh, less economically viable communities and build them up. And it's not meant for the rich to come back in and get more tax credits. So, that's why you don't see very many tax credit projects in the gas lamp anymore, but I have done others elsewhere. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll start showing you some slides, and then I can talk about individual properties. All right? So I have somebody doing that for me. Okay, here's one of my favorites, the Brunswick Building. Uh, this was uh, my client number 13, Mike Ferris. He owned the liquor store in the corner in this building. Um, and it was wonderful to work with. Now, in addition to tax credits on this property, we also did an architectural facade easement. And that's another federal tax incentive. And if it's, it's uh, you agree to, first of all, it has to be on, on the National Register. You agree to maintain the exterior of the building in perpetuity. And in exchange, uh, I mean, you enter into a, an agreement whereby a donee is responsible for enforcing your promise. So you, it's, it's controlled by the legal system that you actually have to do the work if something happens. Um, and then you get a charitable contribution deduction for the reduction in value. And when, when Mike Ferris did this, there were no height limits downtown. There really wasn't that much zoning downtown. So he got to claim the, the loss of value that he could not develop by building a high rise there, if that makes sense. So, uh, so he got a fa facade easement and he got the tax credits. And, uh, oh, next one. And just so you see what a nice man he was, this was Mike. <laughs> this is a mural of Mike that used to be on the south side of that, that building. Anyway, that was uh, an early project that benefited from many things and it, things changed a little bit later. But next. This I like to talk about because, not because of the tax credits, but because this was such forward thinking on the part of the City of San Diego staff. This is a Pioneer Warehouse and Bud Fisher who did many of these buildings and owned many properties here and did wonderful things. Um, it was a warehouse, so this was all solid brick wall. And the warehouses I learned from this and other warehouses are basically built in thousand square foot blocks. So each storage space is a block and the structure is built that way. And there's um, numbers on the ceiling of the block that you can still see in a lot of these warehouses that have been converted. But Normally, that would have been a solid brick. And if we had gone for tax credits, they would not have allowed those windows. They would not have allowed those openings. Uh, uh, but in the city of San Diego did allow, and they were able to do this. So this wasn't a tax credit project, but it was a good example of adaptive reuse that still retained the integrity of the building. So, and still a very successful building. Next. This one, I'm gonna tell you a little story because it's fun. <coughs> Quite often there are these regulations and people figure out a way to get around them a little bit. So this is the McGurk building. And at one time there was an individual involved in the gas lamp quarter and he figured out sort of a, a nice little trick. Uh, so he did a, uh, had me do a part one so it was a, um, a cleared as a contributor and eligible for the tax credits. And then he um, did a conservation easement in the early days. And he did the conservation easement and all he and his buddies took their deduction and then they stopped paying the mortgage. So the lender foreclosed on the building and the foreclosure of the loan wiped out the easement. Oh. So sort of defeated the purpose. So what happened later was they changed the law and now when you do an architectural facade easement you have to subordinate your loan, the lender has to subordinate to the easement, so the easement survives. But that was just, uh, he did that on two buildings. Okay, next. Well, this is a nice building, it's a, the Yuma building, and this was beautifully done by Marsha Sewell. Um, she, her design studio is in the lower level. This is retail, and she and her ex, last husband, Mike, lived upstairs. And she had it, of course, beautifully done. Now uh, it's a 
the, the Heritage Architectural Firm has their offices up there. So that's the premier, premier historical architectural firm, and it's a perfect, perfect building for them. So it's still a wonderful building and, and very well maintained. Oh, and on that one, we did tax credits, but we didn't do an easement. This one was really nice. Early on, this building uh, was covered with stucco. This whole facade was, had been stripped off and it was boring and it was just a flat, flat stucco facade. But these window, the window openings were still underneath, but none of the fabric was here. It was all gone. But right down here was the Bijou Theater that still had all those, that fabric. So we, the, we got the tax credits in by um, proving that the, this facade could be reconstructed by using, measuring the Bijou fabric. So all of this facade was reconstructed, had, had been gone, had been taken out. So this was a great tax credit project, and I think still is a very beautiful building. Um, next. Uh, this is uh, a um, group of buildings, and there are many buildings like this, done by Leon Herrick and his daughter Kathy Herrick Anderson. and. Um, They did both, I think they did tax credits. I'm not sure if they did facade easements, but this was the basic form of gas out anyway. Historically, there were small living units up above and retail or offices on the ground floor. This is the whole pattern. So the pattern retained because these are generally SROs up above or improved apartments up above and the retail and growth. So it's the same living pattern that was here historically. And, um, Kathy and her father did a lot of these buildings. They had a good run. Next. This is another one. The Spencer Ogden building uh, was the same way and it's been, it, it turned into sort of a high class restaurant and bar uh, by the Kellys and it is still doing well but it's the same pattern, housing up above, well excuse me, it's a bar up above. This one is, this was all bar and restaurant. Not that. Next. This is a William Penn Hotel. I don't know why I put it in there. But uh, it's still a good one. It got tax credits. It, well, the people are from, we're, we're from Tucson, so they, uh, they were very interested in getting the benefits from this building, so that worked. Next. Uh, I don't think, Lewis Bank of Commerce, I don't think they got tax credits. I think they had re rehabbed their building the way they wanted it, and uh, they, they, they didn't get approved for tax credits. But these did. This is, Nes keep, well, you can keep going, I'll show you. Nesmith Greeley, they got tax credits. This is the Hubble. And this is, um, Sandy just wrote about this, the second Martian store. And so these all got, in fact, the restaurant Fios, Fios was in here. And the, it was the restaurateur who got the tax credit because he did all the work, so. Anyway, he went on to be in, in many other restaurants. He's a very, very good chef. Okay, next. I don't know why I put this one e in here either, but this was a uh, very early tax credit project, but I didn't work about it, on it, but it, it was, it was uh, you know, um, Jewelers Exchange building and now it's a um, timeshare hotel. Next. This isn't a very good picture of the Granger building, I'm sorry. Um, did he get tax credits on the, this one? Okay. And this is another Bud Fisher. And you know this building is famous for theoretically having the zoo animals stored in the basement. Uh, by the guy who did the zoo. Okay, next. Take the tour. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Send the tour. Nice one. Uh, this is a this is a good one. This is a Samuel Fox building, beautifully done by William Templeton Johnson, and it's it's a contributor, and they have earned the tax credits, and uh, it's it's not so nice. It's it's sort of lofty apartments upstairs, but the ground floor is nice. Next. Okay, now I've taken you out of the gas lamp. Uh, and this isn't a tax credit building, but I just think they did such a great thing with that, with that roof line, the new roof line there, which is, which is uh, open penthouse patios. And it was so well done, and the city approved it, and it's a very nice building. I th it was a bank building, First National Bank. Next. Okay, this is kind of interesting. This is the Owl Drug Building, and we got the tax credits and put this one on the National Register individually. No, as a partner with the next, next building. Next slide. This is the Walker Scott building, the Walker Scott department store. So these two were done together. 
And this is the Fifth Avenue side of the Walker Scott Building. Uh, and, and so the situation was CCDC really wanted to find a solution for the Walker Scott Building because it was sitting there empty and it was so prominent. But it's hard to find a solution for a building where there's no parking and there's no parking in the area. So the decision was to make it a parking garage. So the Walker Scott has retail here and it has one level of apartments here and it has apartments on the eighth floor but all these floors are parking. Wow. And here, you're going to see this in another side, but this is the new building that was built to create the ramp to feed into the parking. So this is where I park every day. So you go in this building and you do a circle and then you feed into these floors and my, the clients didn't really clean it up very well because when you go in there you, you're in a, you, you see the flooring from when it was Walker Scott, it's all paint, painted concrete, you know. And the column pattern is a little bit of a problem for parking spaces, but it worked and still works. And um, these, so these two buildings are connected um, and they, they, you can go back and forth. And they, of course, all have our, the parking garage. So you have an apartment and parking right in the same building. And this was a good tax credit project. Next. This one has been trying, tried over the years. Anyway, it's a wonderful building. I hope it gets done sometime. They've been working on it now for a couple of years. Um, and he paid so much money for it, I'm not sure that he would qualify for the tax credits. But anyway, it's a wonderful building and we have, to, and to me, one of the most important buildings in San Diego. Next. Oh, and this one was before my time. Uh, they were the, some of the earliest tax credits. This is a U.S. grant and they got the tax credits and of course did a beautiful job. And next. Okay, this is my favorite. Uh, I worked on this. This is San Diego Trust, Trust and Savings Building, which was 1920, an absolutely magnificent building by William Templeton Johnson. And marble, and you know, it, it is beautiful. And it still is beautiful. And it was converted to a hotel. Uh, and it has always been the Marriott um, since it was converted. This, uh, Johnson's office was on the top of floor. And this is now the suite, the penthouse suite. This is the ceiling is from his office. So I know you've been in, all of you have been in there and, and I couldn't find a good slide to show you what the interior is, but you'd really need, if you haven't been there, go in because you can see where the teller, where the teller cages were. You can see the indentations in the floor where the people stood to do their banking. And there are things you can see in there and go up to this, the ground floor and the basement, just walk around because it's public space. It's just really magnificent. And that was a good tax. I think they got about five million in tax credits. Okay, now next one. This is the m most recent and last one. This was the HBJ building at 6th and A and Harcourt, Brace, and Jovanovich. And there's a f funny story here, which if I don't trip over a wire, if you look on this old photograph and you see there's a tall high rise right next to it and then on the next block you see a white high, a high rise with writing at the top like a name at the top. Okay, um, HBJ gave this building to the city and what they asked for in exchange was the right to put their name on the top of the building they were moving into. And it wasn't HBJ anymore. It was, you know, Jones and Smith or something. Anyway, so the city got this for free. Um, it wasn't quite a bargain though. It was <laughs> had a lot of problems. It was the San Diego Athletic Club and had some really magnificent spaces. Um, so the city uh, sold it to, or transferred it to, a company called Affirmed Housing and they built uh, affordable housing programs and the program here is called PATH and maybe some of you know what that stands for but basically it's transitional assistance for the homeless and all the lower floors are all services and maybe mul uh, some sort of multi space housing but the upper floors these are all very nice little apartments studio apartments with wonderful views and so as you improve and you're transitioning and you're getting ready, you get to go to the upper floors, but then they don't want to leave. <laughs> no. Why would you leave? <laughs> yeah, so that was a really wonderful project. Um, that, I think, I think they spent 36 million and 
got nine, six million in credit, something like that. So that's the last one I've done. There are a couple, there are some others I worked on, but I think it's a situation where it was, you know, to really get the big money, you have to spend big money, and that, this may or may not be a good investment. So I don't know if there are any more of these coming along, but I certainly enjoyed working on the ones I worked on. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, Dan Pearson told us a story about how he saved the bricks and built the theater building. Remember, if you were there, uh, how he built the Horton Grand Theater. So what he did is he demolished the building, he saved the bricks, and then he built a new building to put the bricks back on. And that was to earn the 10% credits for a building more than 36 years of age. And again, the restriction, the rules were a little bit loose then, and he could do that. But other people were actually dismantling buildings in one part of the city and moving them to a shopping center and rebuilding them and taking the credits. So they changed the law now. In order to get those 10% credits, you have to retain three of the four exterior walls. So can't can't do that anymore but Dan got away with it and it was legal when he did it so so um, I think that the the tax credits came along at a time that was crucial for the gas lamp quarter I don't think it would have been developed as much as it is without this kind of financial assistance and because of the value of the land now in the gas lamp quarter for a variety of reasons you know they got the convention center on one side there's a reason why it's valuable um, I don't think there'll be many tax credits projects in the future. Uh, and, but I certainly enjoyed working on them and, and the architectural facade easement projects I've worked on have also been very rewarding. And it's, it's been fun, so I guess it's time for me to retire. <laughs> it's all over. So, that's it. Thank you. Okay. And are there any questions or should I unplug? <laughs> Why the federal government